So we continue with the application of Gauss to get various values for field um, that uh, <coughs> we are sort of going through the various exercises we did in chapter 22 where we're using Coulomb's law and we did a point charge and we did a, a shell of charge um, <coughs> but uh, you will notice that we have not done a, uh, a ring of charge or a disk of charge because those lack the symmetry in their field to, to and, and uh, a dipole as well would not lend itself to a Gaussian treatment because of the lack of symmetries in the electric field. That Coulomb's law is really the only way to deal with those situations. This is a, I wanted, I was looking for more exercises we could do to practice uh, application of Coulomb's law. And, and I said, oh, well, let's find the field, a distance z off an infinite line of charge of, of linear density lambda and, and charge density. And, and uh, <clears throat> so I set out to do that and I, I cut it up into little infinitesimals of charge dq giving rise to a field de and then I decided to add up all those de's and here you have uh, a statement of Coulomb's law uh, instead of q we have the lambda ds um, and you will note once again that we are only interested in the components going vertically because for all the components going parallel to the line uh, we would have a corresponding bit of charge over here that would take care of that. And so this was the integral I set up. Um, I replaced cosine theta with adjacent over hypotenuse, this is z over r, and, and got to this expression. And, and then I replaced uh, um, this x here. Um, well, I called this x, and so I replace r with uh, the square root of x squared plus z squared. And so I got to this integral. I was feeling very good about myself. And then I could not evaluate this integral. And I could not find it any, in any tables of, of integrals. And I think I probably even went to uh, Miss Reed, who um, uh, tried to get Wolfram Alpha to do it. And we just could not do that. But let's give it a try using Gauss. And, and I would like you to do it. I will, I will prompt you, but see if you can do it without the prompts. Why don't you stop the show and you go through those, I think it was five steps that I wanted you to do every time you tried to apply Gauss to find field strength. And I'm going to start giving prompts. I'm not going to give the answers, but I will give the prompts. But it, it would be good if you could do it without even being prompted. OK, so the, the first prompt would be for you to consider the field around an infinite line of charge. You need to get a, 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 an envisioning of that field. And. Uh, I think it would look like a test tube cleaning brush or a pipe cleaner, if you've ever seen that, that it would go, the field would go everywhere radially outwards and perpendicular to the line of the, uh, the line which was the, the charge distribution. Um, <clears throat> then what you need to do is think about what sort of Gaussian surface you would like to construct. That Gaussian surface needs to pass through this position that is z off the line. But what Gaussian surface would you could you make that would reflect the symmetries that you have discovered in the field? Then the third step would be to write uh, Gauss's law. And, and you need to explicitly state what those, that your Gaussian surface is. And you ought to practice that. What is the description of this Gaussian surface? 
and then write Gauss's law and then um, you need to go back and talk about E at your Gaussian surface. That what about the orientation of E relative to the surface or relative to dA? And what about the magnitude of E at the surface? You need to talk about those two things because without knowing that you cannot evaluate the integral. And then finally you would you would evaluate that integral and solve it for E. And I think you will get a very nice result which you will be proud of, so proud that you will remember it because it will be useful to you to know what the field is, a distance z off of a infinite line of charge. Next, I would like to consider a, a, a conductive plate. Um, this is a near infinite conductive plate, so it's got a very nice uniform charge distribution sigma. And that would be sigma on this edge and sigma on this edge, that the surface charge distribution is sigma for this conductor. And you may or may not recall what the electric field is around a conductor. I hope you do. You need to find some way to remember it. It, is, it was equal to sigma over epsilon. Remember that for an insulator it was different than this. Can you recall that? It was sigma over 2 epsilon for an insulator but sigma over epsilon for a conductor. Well this says conductors and in fact I have two of them. And oops, oh, come back, there we go. No. Okay. Um, I have two conductors. Each one would have a, a, um, a field, a uniform field, with field strength sigma e, sigma over epsilon. But what about when you put the two of them together? What happens to the field? And this is not a matter of superimposing the field. If you just have one, then you've got a uniform field. And if you just had this one, you would have a uniform field. Going in the opposite direction, here it would be uniformly away, and here it would be uniformly towards. But you cannot just superimpose those two uniform fields because when these two conductors are placed next to one another, the fields from each of those will cause the charges within the conductors to rearrange. They will have an induced rearrangement and, and uh, um, we're not very sure about what that's going to look like. I'm going to deal with it this way. I'm going to put a Gaussian surface. Perhaps this is a cylinder. It's got end plates that are parallel to these uh, conductive sheets and here the, the field will be parallel, I'm sorry, perpendicular to the area. So we're not going to have any flux there. And then at the ends there is the possibility of, of having field parallel to the area. But consider the charge enclosed. It has to be that the charge enclosed is zero and so it has to be that the flux through this Gaussian surface is zero and so the flux through the ends must be zero which means that the that can only happen if the field out here is zero so the field here on the outside is going to be zero for both plates now if I then take a Gaussian surface, yeah, I'm trying to take you Gaussian surface, here we go, a Gaussian surface, and I put it with very similar orientation to this one, but I put it so that one end is inside the conductor. We know that the field inside of a conductor is zero, 
So there's no flux here. We've already established that the field is zero here, so there's no flux there. There would have been a perpendicularity issue, or perhaps just that the field is zero. But there's no going to be any flux through any parts of this Gaussian surface. What must we conclude? No charge is enclosed. Ah, so there must be no charge on this side of the conductor. Indeed, oops, I'll just move it that way. If, if we were to put this right up against that one, as long as it was inside, there would be no charge inside of it. So it must be that when we bring those two conductors up to one another, all the charge moves onto this surface. I drew this picture as if charges were inside, but of course we know that all charge resides on the outer skin of a conductor. So now it's all going to be on this skin. I have proved it to myself using Gauss that, that uh, that's the only place charge will be and that charge distribution of sigma, which was present on both faces, now is going to be a, a charge density, I'm sorry, density, not distribution, charge density of two sigma on these two plates. And, and that makes a difference. It's still the case I'll just borrow these, that the field outside, we now know that the charge distributes like this. The field outside is zero, I have established. And if I finally take another Gaussian surface and put it like this, then the um, charge enclosed, here's a statement of Gauss's law, the charge enclosed is going to be two sigma, times the area enclosed and and the e is going to be it's going to be e is going to be perpendicular to da here e is going to be zero here and here e will be parallel to da so i can pull that outside and then the, i'm going to go over the whole surface but really the only part where i'm not getting zeros is when I go over this area here. So the sigma, I'm sorry, the Gaussian integral of dA is just going to yield you an A. And you can solve this for E, and we now have a result for um, the field between two conductors with charge density sigma. This is the field for one conductor with a charge density sigma. You have this other result for an insulator, which is sigma over 2 epsilon. And now I know that the field strength between two uniformly, two plates with charge density sigma is going to be 2 sigma over epsilon, yet a third and new result. Um, if these sheets are not infinite, of course, the field would not be uniform throughout. That if you got towards the middle, it would look very uniform and you would get these results. But out at the edge, you're going to start to get the, the uh, uh, pumpkin of embrace going here, uh, what is spoken of as edge effects or fringing that happens out at the edge. But we, if we stay towards the middle, then our results would be good for a conductor. And you will not be surprised that we are going to work with an insulator. And I hope your little pumpkin head has been able to hold on to what the field is like from an insulator. We need a good mnemonic for this, but um, you, you will recall that it was uh, um, sigma over 2 epsilon for an insulator, uh, but I said insulator. So we've got two insulators. What about the field for these? And again, um, that, that uh, what you've got is, is a, a field which goes away from the, oops, why do you do that to me? Away from the positive um, and a field which goes towards the negative
both of which were uniform. And this time, when I bring these two together, we are not going to get a rearrangement of charge because we have insulators. So even though the fields act on these, they are not able to move around because it's an insulator. And so they stay the same. And so this time I can do a superposition of the fields. You can see clearly that here on the outside, we are going to get a zero. I don't even have to go to Gauss's law to prove that to myself. And here on the inside, we would have them working together. When you superimpose them, this added to this is going to get you a field in between those two that is rather like the result we got for a um, conductor. And perhaps you can make much of that, but it is going to come back to visit you. OK, returning to the shell theorems, which in, in chapter 22, um, we rather bludgeoned our way through. We had an integral that I said was too crazy for me to work with. Your textbook didn't even try to deal with that integral. And, and then um, it didn't really try to, to get into why uh, inside of a shell of charge there was no field. But now, of course, it would be easy. It was not proved to you in chapter 22, but here in chapter 23, piece of cake. These red dots represent a, a uh, uniform distribution, a shell of charge. Um, doesn't matter whether it's a conductor or an insulator. And of course, if you put a Gaussian integral around that surface 2, um, around this, this shell, then we have already shown that if you play the Gauss game, um, that you come up with the same result you would have if all of this charge had been at the center, which was the first shell theorem. And then if you put a Gaussian integral inside that surface 2 here, that there is no charge enclosed, so the field is 0, which was the second shell theorem, that inside of a shell, there's a red shell of charge, no uh, field. But instead of a shell, let's consider a, um, a volume. So this would have to be an insulator. You can't have charge uniformly distributed on a conductor. That's not the way it works. We know that all the charge goes to the outermost skin. But for an insulator, then we would have some possibility of, of uh, playing around inside. First shell theorem. We, we put a Gaussian surface around the outside. And if we were to play the Gauss game, we would find that we would get a result that the enclosed charge would be all the charge on this sphere. And the um, result we would get for the field here would be identical to the results we would get for a field uh, if all of that charge was located at the center. I hope that doesn't seem mysterious to you. And then, um, as we have played with it before, um, we will uh, get inside, put the Gaussian surface inside, and then the enclosed charge is only this part here. If this is at radius lowercase r, whereas the whole sphere has the well, radius capital R, then, then um, I hope you would agree. Oh, you're supposed to come apart. There we go. That the charge enclosed is going to be the total charge times the, the um, ratio of the volume of this sphere to the volume of the big sphere. So that if we are at such a point that the volume of this sphere is half the volume of the big square sphere, then the charge enclosed ought to be half as much. And if you don't trust this, you ought to go ahead and work it out. But then you, you put that together with um, uh, the, the Gaussian treatment. Let's see if I can do it. The charge enclosed now is Q r cubed 
over capital R cubed and for this Gaussian surface, this black line here, um, we would have the um, the field would be everywhere parallel to these DAs here, so I can get rid of the dot product, and it would be uniform in magnitude, so I can pull it outside the integral, and then I'm just doing the Gaussian integral of this uh, sphere of radius lowercase r, which is, this is the area of that sphere, would be 4 pi r squared. And so the field would be equal to Q R dividing through by R squared over four pi epsilon. We're not surprised to see that showing up. R cubed. And so once again we have the result that the field, just like the gravitational field, the electric field is going to go directly as R. Um, let me make this stuff go away and let's consider the graphing of this. That if we were dealing with the conductor or a conductor, sorry, getting there, conductor, then outside of the radius of the conductor, the field would fall off as R squared. But inside the conductor, what would the field look like? Okay. It would be zero inside. So there is what the, the um, graph would look like for the field for a conductor. If instead you had an insulator, and we'll try to just stop with INS, an insul. For an insulator, the field inside would be linear, uh, a, a proportionality, and then outside again, it would fall off as the um, square of the distance, inversely as the square. We are going to keep coming back to these graphs again and again, and I hope they make sense to you, and if they do, then physics is making sense to you, and I say, hurrah.